In today's world, no other continent is home to as many large, dangerous predators as Africa. But is there any one predator among them that is feared above all others? A true apex or super predator? Two years ago, in 2023, researchers in South Africa ran some experiments designed to answer this question. Here's an example. My dad was a teacher, so I grew up in a home that the only thing I knew was sport. So I played tennis, I played cricket, I played rugby, and I loved my sports, and especially cricket and rugby. I mean, it's very moeilijk om an Afrikaans to talk to. As there's not one person who speaks Afrikaans, and no one speaks it back. Of course, in Afrikaans is very interesting to talk. It's very respectful, but... I don't know that I started loving the law. I think there were things that I felt very strongly about. I don't know that I started loving the law. Because we have 11 official languages, English is that one that... Every Basically, they set camera traps at a range of watering holes and set them to trigger the pre-recorded sounds of a wide range of predators. The aim was to see which elicited the most immediate and dramatic response. And yep, far and away, the most feared of all was Homo sapiens. The sound of a woman discussing her interest in the South African legal system struck far more terror into the hearts of thirsty wildlife than the roar of an adult male lion. Here is the research article for anyone who'd like to take a look into this a bit further. Thus, in Africa, the cradle of humanity, humans are the ultimate apex predators. But it was not always this way. We have long known that our earliest ancestors were way more likely to be the prey than the predator. The real question now is, Precisely when and how did our ancestors achieve this extraordinary evolutionary leap from regular cat and eagle snacks to super predators? A number of recent studies have shed light on these questions, and I'd like to talk about them. So, if you're interested in finding out when and how humans flipped their position in the food pyramid from hunted to hunter, then keep watching. Hi, I'm Professor Steve Rowe. I'm a paleontologist who does real paleontologist stuff like reconstructing fossils, naming new species, publishing dozens of scientific articles and supervising PhD students. I've even been known to get my hands dirty in the field. And this means that on this channel, you're watching real paleontology from a real paleontologist. Okay, so we've known for decades that at least some early human species commonly fell prey to big carnivores in Africa. The oldest evidence comes from an examination of the Tung child, a young Australopithecus africanus from South Africa dated to around two and a half million years in age. The likely culprit was a large crowned eagle that left large puncture marks in its eye sockets along with other scratches and damage consistent with predation by a large raptor. Another very well-known example is of predation on Paranthropus robustus by a leopard that left canine tooth punctures in its skull around 1.8 million years ago. And there are other examples of likely predation on species of both Paranthropus and Australopithecus by hyenas, lions, and even saber-toothed cats, not to mention crocodiles. On the other hand, it's pretty clear that at least some of our ancient relatives had developed a taste for meat by 2.6 million years ago, and quite possibly much earlier still. In this 2010 paper by McFerrin and friends, the authors claim to have found evidence for butchery using stone tools on animal carcasses almost 3.4 million years old. This interpretation has been widely contested. However, if it's Ultimately substantiated, it will be of particular interest because 
the oldest members of our genus, Homo, don't appear in the fossil record until around 2.6 million years ago, or perhaps 2.8 at the earliest. And of course, evidence for butchery is not necessarily evidence for active hunting. The oldest evidence for hunting, as opposed to scavenging by early humans, is from cut marks on small antelope bones from a Kenyan archaeological site dated to around 2 million years ago. As reported here by Jennifer Parkinson and friends in 2022. Although at present, it's not clear which human species made these cut marks. Another thing to be borne in mind here is the significance of scavenging in human evolution. Many researchers have argued that scavenging meat and bone marrow may have played a pivotal role, particularly with respect to the evolution of early Homo. This is a whole subject area in itself, and I won't go into detail on it here, except to point out that, as with the transition from prey animal to predator, this is not a simple binary all or nothing issue. There are few, if any, predators that don't include at least some carrion in their diets, and there are few so called scavengers that never kill their own prey. If you're interested in this debate, this very recent article here by Matthias and friends will give you a window into the relevant literature. Anyway, back to our original question. How and when did humans flip their position in the food pyramid from hunted to hunter? Well, straight up, before we go any further, I also need to point out that a predator can, of course, be both predator and prey. In fact, the great majority of predators are both. Only true apex or super predators are largely immune from predation by other species. In this context, it makes sense that the oldest evidence for active predation by previous members of our family tree has been recovered from small game. You don't go from being a small, mostly plant-eating bipedal primate to giant slaying super predator overnight. There had to be some kind of transitional period. Now the consensus view has long been that this transition was made by a species within our genus Homo, which brings us to this paper published just a couple of months ago. These guys used artificial intelligence and computer vision to analyze tooth marks on two fossils of the oldest member of our genus, Homo habilis. They trained the AI on a library of nearly 1,500 images of tooth marks made by modern carnivores, including leopards, lions, crocodiles, and hyenas. Once it was trained, they gave the AI photos of the marks on the habilis bones to determine whether they were made by a predator, and if so, which species. Long story short, they found that both specimens of Homo habilis had fallen prey to leopards. Considered together with previous evidence of predation on this species, they concluded that Homo habilis was definitely not an apex predator. This is a neat study, but I don't think that it was particularly surprising to anyone. And if we take a closer look, I think you'll see why. Firstly, Homo habilis was tiny, standing at around 1 to 1.4 metres in height, that's 3.3 to 4.4 feet, and averaging around 32 kilograms, or 70 pounds in weight. The reasons most paleontologists place this species within our genus are based on features of its skull. In particular, Homo habilis had a significantly larger brain, smaller teeth, and a flatter face than its gracile and robust Australopith relatives. However, in other respects, there appear to be few differences. Like Australopiths, Homo habilis was clearly bipedal, but still retained adaptations for climbing that have been lost in other members of our genus. So if we want to identify the first apex predator in our family tree, we need to look further afield. But as it turns out, not much further. Here we're talking about Homo erectus. At around 2 million years in age, the oldest representatives of this species overlapped in time and possibly space 
with Homo habilis, and Homo erectus was very different. Aside from generally having an even larger brain and flatter face, erectus was considerably bigger overall and appears to have further increased in body size over time. Regarding brain size, in species of Australopithecus and Paranthropus, brain volumes typically ranged from a little over 400 to a little over 500 grams. A commonly quoted average brain size for Homo habilis is around 650 grams. Brain size in Homo erectus was typically much bigger on average, but varied greatly, which is perhaps unsurprising given its vast temporal and geographic range, which included not only much of Africa, but large swathes of Europe and Asia too. Some of the oldest Homo erectus, which interestingly are not found in Africa, but in 1.8 million year old deposits in Domenici, Georgia, had body sizes from around 40 to 55 kilograms. But Homo erectus in Africa at around 1.6 million years in age approached the size of modern humans at around 50 to 70 kilograms. Later Homo erectus from Southeast Asia were of comparable size. Brain size seems to have increased over time too, from not much larger than Homo habilis to almost twice the size at over 1,200 grams. It wasn't just increases in brain and body size that distinguish erectus from habilis. Postcranial features that first appear in Homo erectus show that it was a less competent climber. On the other hand, as shown in this 2013 paper by Roach and Friends, modifications to the shoulder enabled superior elastic energy storage and release, resulting in a greatly improved capacity to throw objects, be they rocks or spears. Although we have no hard evidence that Homo erectus fashioned and threw spears, it takes no great leap of imagination to envisage it. Importantly, although erectus was a less effective climber than Habilis, there is no doubt that it was a far more efficient runner. Among many other indicators, its legs were relatively longer, its foot was more rigid, and its gluteus maximus muscle, which is critical for maintaining stability while running, was much better developed. Importantly, many researchers are convinced that Homo erectus had a superior thermoregulatory system, basically a seriously upscaled capacity to dump heat while running. Simply being taller and longer limbed gave erectus an advantage here, but many believe it likely that with Homo erectus we had the first truly naked, almost hairless human. Add a bunch more sweat glands to this naked body and you have a heat dumping system that is second to none. As argued by Roxton and Wilkinson here in 2011, this thermoregulatory system could only have worked on humans with similar body proportions to those of we modern humans, effectively excluding Homo habilis, but not Homo erectus. Anyway, considered together, it's widely thought that these adaptations would have allowed erectus to carve out its own unique niche as the first predator capable of running down its prey to the point of exhaustion and collapse in the heat of the African day. We are talking persistence hunting theory here, which is a concept I cover in more detail in this earlier video. Bottom line is, though, that if Erectus did engage in persistence hunting, it seems really unlikely that they would apply this very energetically expensive and time-consuming approach just to bring home small game. Anatomical and physiological adaptations aside, it's also notable that shortly after the appearance of Homo erectus, we also find the first evidence of a new stone tool tradition, the Acheulean. These large bifacial tools, including hand axes and cleavers, are a real step up on the previous old one culture. This would have certainly made for faster and more efficient butchery of large animal carcasses. Now, all that said, it remains a fact that to date, there is 
no conclusive evidence that Homo erectus actively hunted big prey. But there is plenty of evidence attesting to the likelihood that megafauna were included in their diet. For example, in this very recent paper, the authors describe freshly broken bones from a straight tusked elephant weighing several tons in association with Acheulean stone tools recovered from East African deposits almost 1.8 million years old. Even if this elephant was scavenged, it seems likely that these Homo erectus were able to defend this high value carcass from other large predators. Of course, elephants represent particularly daunting prey, and there is perhaps stronger evidence for active predation on smaller, but still very large prey, including antelope exceeding 300 kilograms in weight. The bottom line is that to me, there can be little doubt that at least some populations of Homo erectus were hunting big game, and were also entirely capable of holding their own against other large predators meaning that if they weren't actual apex predators, they must have been darn close. This doesn't mean that Erectus never fall prey to other large carnivores. In fact, there is evidence that at least one of the specimens from Domanesi in Georgia was killed by a large carnivore. But of course, even today, modern humans can very occasionally fall prey to big predators. Assuming that Homo erectus became an apex or even near apex predator, a striking feature of this transition is that it was very fast. We have the very first Homo habilis appearing at around 2.6 million years ago, and the very first Homo erectus appearing in South Africa at around 2 million years ago. It seems that perhaps within half a million years, our lineage went from small bipedal omnivores with a penchant for a bit of meat on the side to a relatively large and effective persistence hunter of big game. And from being a common prey item on the menu of a range of African predators to a species that could at least, acting cooperatively, stand its ground against the biggest, baddest predators that Ice Age Africa could throw at them. Okay, I'll wind it up there. And if you enjoyed the show, please like and subscribe. It'd be much appreciated. See you again soon.